Welcome to PC Games Nostalgia, where we talk about yesterday's PC games today. My name is Jimmy Wilhelmsson and I will be your host for the next 20 minutes or so. The title we're going to probe into today is... Each time we bring a guest from the game industry to our digital studio and today's honored guest star is Frederik Vestal, chairman of the board of Paradox Interactive. Uh, welcome Mr. Vestal. Thank you very much, really good to be here and thanks for inviting me. Thank you. May I call you Frederik by the way? Of course you may. Fred is actually most people say Fred, so I wouldn't say, suggest you say that. I am most people, so I will call you Fred from now on. <laughs> Uh, tell me, this is the first time we have a chairman of the board uh, and actually the first time we have someone from Paradox Interactive also. What do you do? What does a chairman of the board do? Well, I guess it depends on who the chairman is. I mean, uh, my background is uh, I used to be the CEO of Paradox before. I used to be the executive VP. So I've been running the company more or less for the last 17 years together with others. Obviously, I haven't been alone. Wow. Uh, but um, so in my role of chairman, I overlook a lot of business development stuff, looking at if we want to buy other companies, for example, and also leading the board work uh, on a daily basis. So it's a little bit of everything, but it's still uh, most of my days are filled with work for Paradox Interactive. So I'm not doing much other, many other things actually in my work life, at least. Okay. Then I'm a parent as well, and that's probably half of the time <laughs> that it goes to. But you are, are you still involved in any way in the, uh, the game development? No, unfortunately, I haven't been in, in the game development for the last five, six years, uh, almost at all, because the company is now so big, we're close to 600 people that the game teams are so much bigger today and they need specialized people are a lot better uh, at what they do than uh, I've been uh, in my entire career uh, when it comes to making games. But in the early days of Paradox, I also worked uh, in operations with the games as well. What kind of games uh, did you work uh, operatively in, uh, in the old days? Uh, Hearts of Iron 2, for example, okay. uh, I was a part of the games team. I didn't do a lot, like I wasn't super specialized. I was still doing the marketing and sales stuff, but I was involved in the meetings and parts of the game design decisions. Uh, together with Joan Anderson, our legendary game programmer, we together uh, designed the Doomsday expansion pack, for okay. example. And I did a lot of work on the first Crusader Kings game. Uh, and well, if you take 15, 16 years back, a lot of involvement in the games that were made. Speaking of Crusader Kings, you just recently released Crusader Kings 3. Keep your enemies close. The first step in avoiding the trap is knowing it is there. How was that received? How were the, uh, the numbers? You don't have to tell me the numbers, yeah, but been, what, what, are, is it good or bad? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's been, it's been a fantastic reception. It's been the highest scoring game that Paradox has ever released with a 91 on Metacritic, which is considered a, a Metacritic must play. Wow. I've been playing the game for the last six months and only in the last two months, over 80 hours spent in the game. So I can vouch for the game personally as well if needed. So, but I'm, I'm also a huge fan of what we do. So I might be a bit biased and I'm also the biggest owner in Paradox. I might be biased for that reason as well. You, so you might be. don't listen too much to me. Listen to other what other people are saying about our games, not what I'm saying. No, I can. I haven't played uh, uh, the third uh, uh, Crusader Kings, but I did actually play, and this is true. I did play the board game last weekend together with a bunch of friends. We were five people, full house, playing the board game. You didn't develop the board game. That was uh, a publishing house called the Free League, right? That's correct. Yeah, it's an unlicensed. Exactly, unlicensed. And even the board game is is really good. I'm a board game uh, fan also, and I, I have to say, I'm I am not biased that right. that much. <laughs> uh, and it's a great game. I mean, it's uh, you have different eras and you have different kinds of kings. I played, of course, William William the Conqueror, who is brave, pious, and and cruel and dim witted. I was dim witted, oh. and I also married a go. stupid wife. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. 
ge- genetically inheritable traits, <laughs> exactly. stupidity, I think. So it's, it's good. It's good. Exactly. Speaking about, and this is quite elegant, speaking about William the Conqueror, the game we're going to talk about today is Defender of the Crown from Cinema. Yeah. Yes, that's a pretty nice transition. Why did you choose this game, Frederick? Well, when you talk about games that for, uh, formed your youth and childhood and it gave you an idea of what computer games are, there there is a handful of games that meant a lot more to me than other games. And I would say probably the one that meant the most is Defender of the Crown when it comes to the breakthroughs the game made in graphics and gameplay. Yeah. So it was like, it was a huge milestone, a big step forward. The first time you saw it, it was like a sm- like a smack in the face. It was like so beautiful and so well made. <laughs> That's what we thought back then, like late 80s or so. So let's go so. back here. Defender of the Crown is released in 1986 on the Amiga system, right? Right. Uh, what kind of game is it? If you would describe Defender of the Crown now to someone uh, who has never seen it but is knows about games today, how would you describe Defender of the Crown? I would describe it as like maybe, maybe the wor- the world's first grand strategy games. Okay. Pretty much like the games that we create today, but obviously much less advanced. So what you do is you play on a map of England uh, and you start out as one of, I think, four or five uh, kings that are Saxon kings and you try to fend off the Norman invasion. Yes, basically. the Saxons are the good guys. The Saxons are definitely the good guys. You can play Wilfred of Ivanhoe, I think, is one of the characters yeah. from um, from the novel of, of Sir Walter Scott, Correct. right? This is Correct. A uh, 19th century writer. And so basically, you can also cooperate with Robin Hood if you go into the Sherwood Forest. And there's a lot of abstractions around the game. Yeah. But there's one guy called the Longsword as well. The characters are obviously fictional, but... So if I remember correctly, the game takes place when the king dies and the, the, there are different factions fighting for the crown. Right. So what your goal is ultimately to unite England under Saxon rule. But the, the backside to this is that the Saxons are much worse than the Normans <laughs> in everything. They're weak. I think they're we- the characters are weaker. They have worse stats. Even, I think, if I remember correctly, even your castles are worse off yeah. than the Norman ones. So basically, uh, it, it's a game that is biased towards the Norman strength, but but it's also a good one because it, it makes you think, it makes you make up your strategy. But also another thing that I think is interesting are the mini games that are added to the game. So whenever you are supposed to invade a castle, you need to use the catapult first to break down the wall step by step. And if you break down the full wall, it's easier to invade the castle than if you failed on on, on hitting with your stones. So there's a lot of things going on in the game. The best part is the jousting, I think, when there's (laughs) a jousting tournament, if you remember that. Yes, yes, I do. You you run against the other one and your horse is shaking and you're supposed to hit the other one with your lance. (laughs) But if you hit the horse, you lose the whole joust, you lose like gold and prestige or whatever it's called as well in the games. <laughs> and this is a terrible, well, games this are- is a terrible thing on the Amiga because you have to joust with the mouse. And back in 1986, yeah. we didn't play games with the mouse. I don't know what we did. We, we, we just pointed and cl- opened maps or folders and, and drawers. It, it, it was called drawers in the Amiga operating system. It's not folder, it's a drawer. Yeah. So we weren't <laughs> used to it. And I remember it no. was much harder jousting on the Amiga platform than in any other uh, of, the, of the computers back there. Um, oh, yeah. Mini games, you said. That's interesting. I, I, would, nor- I would describe uh, Defender of the Crown as a game of Risk. Everybody's played Risk, right? Yeah. The board game Risk, but with mini games. Yeah. You just move, you move, you move one army. You can't move like several units. You just move one unit, one army with you as a leader, I, I guess, and just move it around. Yeah. So if you're back down there in the Essex fighting with someone and some other goes up north uh, or, or uh, by the Sherwood Forest, you're not there. Your army is gone. Right. But if you also remember one of my like grandest like impressions from the game was when you're supposed to rescue like if it's maid marion or another damsel in distress in one of the mini games that you walk into the castle 
and there's a shadow on the wall yeah. from the torchlight. Right. And it was like, this is so beautiful. It's like unbelievable. How can you even do this? It's some kind of black magic. <laughs> it was probably like programmed the shadows because there was no shadowing or anything, no game engines that took care of that. But it, it just looked so beautiful. You couldn't believe yeah, it. Yeah, it's a sprite of its own. You have two sprites with the two fighting guys, yeah. <laughs> and then you have two sprites with the shadow. I don't know. This is technical exactly. stuff, children. Magic. Uh, yeah. Yes, that was really cool. Um, and also, the guy, when you fight in the stair, it's impossible to fall. Even right. if, you're, I... if your HP, if your health points are, are out, I mean, if, if the opponent's health points are out, there is no animation for him to fall in the stairs. So you have to push him all right. the way up the stairs until he can fall down. I thought that was a cool right. thing because you knew I've already yeah. won and you wanted to, you know, boast a little and you just you know, had fun with him in the, in the stairs. Defender of the crown. The king is dead, you say, but also the crown is gone. There's a bit of storytelling in, in the... Uh, the crown has disappeared. That's basically what it's all about. Everybody is blaming everyone and the crown is gone. Should we spoil right. where the crown is? We, actually, we should, but I don't remember where it was. The crown. So you have to spoil Robin it Robin Hood has the crown. Uh, Whenever you yes, win the yeah. game, if you defeat all the Normans, uh, Robin Hood yeah. comes, and of, of course he had it all along. So it's it's not disappeared anymore, and you get this right. the end thing. Yeah, because and, and for some reason Robin Hood is very pro-Saxon in the game as well. Of course so he he's is. on your side. He's a cool so guy. You, you, he's a cool guy, but like as like since the Normans have like uh, Viking blood and are, are by blood uh, Scandinavian. I mean, we're biased towards the Normans. So <laughs> it's a bit of a, a uh, balance there as well, I guess, uh, as a Scandinavian. But you have to take a pro-Saxon stance in the game. You don't like that. I can see it in your eyes. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I'm still, the jury is still out there. I don't remember it as a kid, though, because it didn't matter. But nowadays I'm like, mm, is this really correct? You know, it's like... <laughs> there is another thing. Um, back in the days... What we did play in 1986 was definitely not games that competed with movies, but that was what Defender of the Crown was all about. As a matter of fact, that was what the developer Cinemaware was all about. Cinemaware, this was their first game. And I remember reading articles about it now when I'm old, when, when Cinemaware was founded, they, they boasted and they said, we're gonna make games that are not games, they're interactive movies. Right. So Defender of Crown was exactly. actually, it, it was, I, I told you before, it, uh, like you said, when you win, it says the end. It's, it's, all, it's all set up like a movie. And yeah. I think uh, on the back of the box, you had popcorn and other things to make it really feel like a, like a movie. And, and the, um, yeah. the cover, you remember the cover? It was kind of green. And two knights were fighting, and there was a damsel in distress yeah. in the middle. This was 1980s, so you wouldn't make a cover like that today, but it's still very iconic for, for the whole cinema where uh, genre. Yeah, compared to, compared to the covers that were out there during these days, <laughs> the cover on Defender of the Crown was like magic. It was yeah. like an Elmore drawing. Yeah basically. Uh, for the ones of you who played the old Dungeons and Dra Dragons, Elmore was the guy who made the most uh, like amazing art, at least what I thought when I was like 10 years old playing Dungeons and Dragons, yeah. which I understood half because it was in English. But uh, no, but when you mentioned it, Cinemaware as well, like they made a couple of other games. They, it came from the desert, I think is one of their games. It also turned into like not even a B-list, but a C or D-list yeah. like Hollywood movie. Uh, Wings, King of Chicago was theirs as well. Absolutely. Right? So they had a couple of, of things going there, and, and uh, no, it was a good company. I don't know why they went out of business. Probably a lot of budget into one game, and, and, and uh, that didn't sell. It's a story that's been repeated. Before. I think eventually, I don't know either. Uh, this is just get. I think they they went bankrupt in um, early '90s, actually, or mid '90s. I, I absolutely don't know. I haven't checked this out, but I guess other game companies caught up. Uh, they did make games that was a story that just was linear, and then you had a bunch of mini games. It came from the desert was really cool, and I played it. The desert, unchanged for millions of years, 
yet witness to a biblical prophecy come true that one day the meek shall inherit the earth. But it had a low, very low replay value. Uh, yeah. Once you knew the story and you played all the mini games, it was that was kind of it. Defender of the Crown is actually you can play it over and over, but you get you yeah. get too good at it, so it's not it's not a game really more. But, but yeah, after a while, you kind of know how to use the catapult. Yeah. You know how to do the battles, and then you win every time. Yeah. And then kind of the replayability goes away. But if they if it was today, they would have a chance to tweak the mini games, I guess, and rebalance things and add new things. It yes. would make a great game today as well if you just keep it updated, and that's the thing. And because different uh, level, uh, um, what do you say? Uh, not, to make it harder, you, you need different. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, make it uh, hard, easier, or whatever. It was just one yeah. game with one level of, yeah. of difficulty. Yeah, you, you could have different scenarios. You can add like a 13th century scenario, if you like, as opposed to the 12th century and have new characters in there and whatnot. Oh my so, God, you got to buy the license. <laughs> <laughs> it, it does sound like it, doesn't it? You need this license. Spe speaking about the cover, you mentioned the cover. Uh, I have a funny story. I mean, you are the guest star, yes, but I, I, I want to tell you because I know you don't know this story. The cover is actually painted by an American painter uh, who is named Ezra Tucker. And he is kind of famous today for his uh, animal paintings. He's a really a good painter. So I, I found out that he was the painter back in 2013. And I interviewed him. I wrote an article about it. And he came back to me because the, the, the painting is gone. Nobody knows where it is. Oh, and he like the crown in Defenders of the Crown. Yes, and he came back to me this year, 2020, in February. It was before all this uh, pandemic thing going on, with an email where he said, "I found it." He showed me oh. a picture, and he had found the actual painting. And he said to me, "And this is true. Do you want to buy it?" And I said, "Yes." Eventually, I didn't because it was a lot of money, and uh, well, the, the the deal didn't go through. So now I know it's uh, another uh, collector bought it, so it's in good hands. But the painting exists; it has been found. Nice. Yeah, I can see the it's fire like, in your eyes. But, <laughs> yeah, that's nice. I was just going to ask how much you wanted for it, uh, but it's gone no, now. I I, we can talk after this show. <laughs> I think that's classified sure, information, I mean, but but it's out there. Yeah, cool. I mean, speaking about covers, I'm, I'm into the other track of Crusader Kings again, another m medieval game, mm -hmm. obviously, that is kind of, if you want to be generous, is similar to Defender of the Crown. The first cover of Crusader Kings was actually made as a painting first as well, and then digitalized oh, from that. Okay. But on the painting, the Crusader holds the sword in his left hand. Okay. So what we did in the digital image was to mirror image it so it looks like he holds it in his right hand, so so as not to be uh, sinful, because left-handed people, uh, it was not okay according to the Catholic Church to be left-handed. Ah, uh, and you never but told the painter. Supposed to be. You never told the painter. Right, yeah. and I think I think the painter um, Alvaro is left-handed himself, uh, and I don't think he he thought about it when he painted it, and we just figured out from uh, feedback from our forums quite early on in the Crusader Kings. Uh, is it Alvaro Tapia you're talking about? Yeah. Okay. Correct. Yeah. Great guy. Yeah. Great painter. So you have that painting somewhere in your bedroom or whatever. No, we have it somewhere in the office, but our office now is 10,000 square meters. <laughs> I'm not sure in which departments. It takes quite of a walk like to find. I saw it just the other weeks. So I know it's there somewhere. That's a cool. Probably where the Crusader Kings team is. Okay. But that's a cool thing. I mean, why don't, I mean, obviously covers are not that important anymore when it comes to games. You buy them on Steam or whatever. So, so but I mean, since you have pretty, I mean, big budgets anyway, why, why not make uh, a, a full size real painting every time? Because it is a cool thing to, to hang at the office. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with that. One of the greatest thing as well with Defender of the Crown and other games at that time was that they came in these big boxes yes. as well. So it felt like a lot of value to buy it. And then they got smaller and smaller down to a DVD package, mm -hmm. basically, which kind of, I understand this is more environmentally friendly and, and for every reason it's better to have a small package than a big one. But these old Sierra boxes, they still have, have a certain 
like feeling to it to open it and then all of a sudden it's like opening a bag of chips because all of a sudden like everything is just at the bottom there's like it's not full of <laughs> chips it's just like a third of it yeah. same with those sierra boxes it was like a manual and some sort of these um three inch discs right, right. or the f old flop right the five inch ones but it's supposed so, to look yeah, good yeah. in the shelf in your bookshelf it's a it's a game that is supposed to draw the attention to whenever you have a guest or something it's it's a nice exactly box. we still have we still have some old like europe universalis boxes like sierra boxes because the original yeah. europe universalis yeah. was, was released in one of those and then it went out of fashion for some reason it had a good 15 year runners right uh let's speak a bit a little bit about the graphics you said it had amazing graphics and it was released on what was then an amazing computer uh the amiga in 1986 was brand new actually the Ami this is from a time when the amiga was called the amiga only because at least in europe the Amiga 500 and the Amiga 2000 was not released yet. It was released in 1987 in right. most parts of Europe, at least where I come from. Uh, so uh, when, when uh, Defender of the Crown was, a really, was one of the first games on the Amiga platform, they really wanted to get it out there to show this is what graphics should be like. This is how games are going to be in the future. Yeah. Yeah, I, I remember when the Amiga came because I had a Spectrum uh, at home where the 16K memory in original and then you had to buy extra memory. It was like a hundred dollars and then you got like an outstanding 48K memory on the, on the whole like super power machine. Yeah. Uh, and when the Amiga came, it had 512 uh, mega, uh, kilobytes, I think. Hence the that was Amiga the 500. 500. The Amiga, the first Amiga yeah. that was re later renamed to Amiga 1000, it only had 256, but it still had great, great oh, graphics. Yes, right. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And and it was known then, like in our block, like where I lived up in the north in Umeå, uh, my parents or or my mom and stepdad who bought me the Spectrum, they were like, yeah, computers is the future. So you need to have a computer. Oh, wow. yes, I have the Spectrum, and they were very forward forward looking. So. But then I said, we need to buy an Amiga. And they were like, what for? <laughs> and all of a sudden I realized I had no good selling points for it because the only thing I had to sell was the graphics. And I knew they were not going to buy it. So it was kind of one of those awkward moments you should have prepared better for uh, with like telling them about all the good programs that the Amiga had, which it really didn't because I didn't know about them at least. Uh, so I didn't get an Amiga, but a friend of mine who was just a couple of blocks away, he got the Amiga because his dad always wanted the, new, the newest like tech stuff. So I spent a lot of time at his place. Okay. So that's how we played all the Amiga games. So that's where I familiarized So he wasn't the better it. salesperson. He just had a, 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 a dad that was more interested. He had objecti <laughs> objectively better parents than my dad, you know, <laughs> at least from a perspective of a 30-year-old. So. <laughs> that's great. So that's how I, I familiarized myself. We spoke a bit about the fairy tale adventure as well, which was another game that was just yes, a previous, on a previous discussion. Fairy tale adventure. Maybe some other episode yeah. we will uh, talk about that also. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's a good game as well. But then it was known as the machine or the home computer that had the same graphics as an arcade machine. Yes. I which was totally mind blowing. Yes. Uh, it really didn't have that because the arcade machines were still like bigger and could, could handle a lot, a lot more power, obviously. But uh, we were used to going to the mall, play Gauntlet, play Double Dragon or whatever arcade games you played. And then you had to spend a fortune to even get to the next level. I, I sucked at Gauntlet <laughs> while my, my older brother, he could play Gauntlet for a full day on five Krona. So we were very uneven in our family in, in terms of skill and games. <laughs> so Defender of the Crown was perfect to me. You could play it over and over again until you actually won the game instead of paying for it. So that was a new experience. But, uh, the Amiga wasn't uh, like the arcade machines, as you say, but it was getting there because the other... Cinemaware was an early company that invested in the Amiga. A lot of companies didn't because they didn't believe in it. Uh, it was very right. expensive. The other company that was uh, heavily invested in the Amiga was a competitor of yours today, Electronic Arts. Yeah. They released, yeah, yeah. among other things, uh, something called Deluxe Paint, which is, uh, of course, a paint software that is actually the predecessor of today's Photoshop. It, was, it had a lot of feature, ba features back in 1985, 1986 that was not available to uh, PC, the PC platform or the, the Windows platform until the 90s. 
actually. Yeah. Frederick, it's been nice yeah. having you here. It's been nice reliving yeah. the moments of uh, saving damsels in distress and beating Normans, even though they were Vikings and really the cool ones. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much for coming here and good yeah. luck to you in your future endeavors within Paradox Interactive or whatever you're doing, whatever games you are uh, developing. And thanks for inviting me. It was great to be here. And uh, next time, if you want me back, we'll talk the Paratale Adventure or even Nintendo, maybe. <laughs> I played a lot of games back in those days. You're a salesperson now. <laughs> <laughs> I am. Thank you so much. Cool. Thank you so much. And take take care. care. Bye. Cheers. Bye.